Europe and the United Kingdom are grappling a gas crisis. We also have a potential tightening of monetary policy by the Fed. Uh, the world economy seems to be heading to a funk. Now, how do we understand it from an emerging market or an India perspective? We have the best of guests on Indianomics today. I have with me Lord Meghnath Desai, the Indian-born British economist, member of the Labour Party for, what, 50 years? And, uh, of course, someone who has kept very close track of British politics even today. Lord Desai, thank you very much indeed for joining thank me you. today. So, first, I want you to interpret uh, the global economy for us. Uh, this gas crisis, uh, uh, does it uh, mean that we are going to have a longish bit of stagflation in Europe and what will that mean for emerging markets? Well, you know, <clears throat> I believe in a very old-fashioned way in what I call long cycles. Okay. The contractive you know, cycle, the as you say. The cycle. I learned all this. In India, under Brahmanand, he okay. taught us when we were doing business cycles. In Bombay University. Yeah, yes. in, in Schumpeter, in Schumpeter's two-volume book on business cycles. Now, Conrad, because it's a 50-year cycle, when he was writing, there had only been two. Now we have had a few more. So we have a little bit more confidence. I lived through one Conrad year cycle already in the 1970s. May I interrupt you for a minute, sir? Uh, just to tell viewers that the Kondratif cycle, uh, economist Kondratif believed in 50-year cycles. He looked at agricultural commodities, at copper, and said that they normally move in 50-year cycles. So 50 years ago, in the 70s, there was a long period of stagflation. Sorry for yeah. the interruption, but so, tell no, us. No, no, you, you, this is a footnote, you know, you have to keep footnotes. Yes. Now, see, so 70s to about end of 80s. We had a serious inflationary crisis. All the countries had inflationary crisis. The paradigm changed from Keynesian economics to monetary economics. You know, we were full employment, then unemployment became the cure for inflation. And everybody was caught into it. It's a global problem. Yes. The global problem was triggered by an energy price rise. Yes. Very much like at present, energy, oil price quadrupled. <coughs> You know, when the OPEC people... Early 70s. Yes. Oil price had not changed from 1918 to 1972. Oh, okay. And it quadrupled. Partly because the dollar had depreciated when America went off the dollar gold yes. thing. gold stamp. Uh, but, you know, think of dollar, gold was $35 an ounce and lost price it is right now. Yes. You know, we have lived through a lot of inflation. But... It didn't go away very quickly. For a while, we tried uh, Keynesian policies and so on, Phillips goes on. But ultimately, the monetarists came to power in the 1980s. Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, Helmut Kohl. Paul Volcker. Paul Volcker, and Paul Volcker. And Paul Volcker got in there and increased interest rates like nobody's business. And the idea was, without ex real pain, there is no cure to inflation. There are no easy ways out of stagflation. And in a sense, we learned a lot at that time. I mean, uh, the new prime minister of Britain, Liz Truss, thinks Margaret Thatcher cut taxes. Margaret Thatcher did not cut taxes till after a third victory. You know, in the late, late 1980s, you know, she allowed uh, Nigel Lawson to cut taxes. But until then, they paid unemployment benefit out of North Sea oil, out of, uh, out of selling national industries. National assets, yes. Railways. All that money disappeared in paying unemployed. But that was a cost of fighting inflation, and that cost had to be borne. The cost of fighting yeah. inflation was creating unemployment. Without, without, without slowing the economy down. Now, I wish it was a, there's a better way, and I have, I've always fought monetarism and all that. But here I'm in the second conductive cycle of my life. Okay? Again, energy prices have risen. We have added a war to it this time. Last time we didn't, we didn't have a serious. There was an Arab Israeli war, but that was not. No, not kind of global scale. So now we have a Russia-Ukraine war. 
which is unfortunately not going to end soon. I think it's going to let, go on for four years. That, that, that's my estimate. And we don't know whether the Taiwan thing will will flare up or not. If Taiwan will flare up, then all, all, all bets, bets are, are off. <laughs> so we have an oil price rise, uh, energy price rise, which without any other thing will cause a stagflation. And if you add war to it. So difficult times are coming ahead. I don't want to be an optimist. I want to be a pessimist. I want to tell people, don't think, and don't think it is happening to India. This is happening to the whole world. Yeah, but uh, Lord Desai, you know, in the in the seventies, we had our own problem. I mean, we had a huge grain crisis. The Green Revolution really took off thereafter. Yeah. Uh, we uh, we had our problems. Right now, Asia seems to be in a better spot. Uh, inflation is not uh, as yeah. bad. I mean, we are in the six handle, whereas uh, the West is in eight or nine percent handles. Uh, as well, growth is not so badly affected. So do you think Asia and India may get away with the smaller bruises? I don't know which part of the globe you're going to live in. <laughs> you know, what, what makes people think somehow we can globalize when we like and we can deglobalize when we like, we'll globalize for good things and deglobalize for bad things? You know, I mean, I it think, doesn't work I like think that. I would rather that people start pessimistically okay. than they write optimistically. You know, you know. I, I always, even in my personal life, I think, what's what is the prepare for the extreme worst extreme cost of the you know, what's, what's the maximal cost? Now, maximal loss, because that prepares you to be cautious about these things, and you don't get into false optimism. Oh, we are different from everybody else. You know, a lot of India's problem is we are different from everybody else. We are have a different kuchne. We are like everybody else. And you know, even even when you talk about about the, the Green Revolution, the Green Revolution did not come anything that happened in the world. We had two famines. Yes. 64, 65, 65, 67. Yes. I had I had left the country in 61. But we were very non the line that we didn't like the Americans, but we were eating American wheat. Yes. You know, PL four eighty. Uh, and then because all through the 50s, we thought agriculture is all right. We want to have land reform and this and that. It all thought to be a distribution problem in agriculture. It was a productivity Production problem. Properties. And for the productivity problem, we had to rely on the private sector, farmers. Yes. You know, we didn't, the planning commission had nothing to do with it. We gave the farmers incentives, and the farmers paid us back. Yes. Now, what that means, and let me continue. We showed faith in the private sector. And I think we need once again to show that it is the private sector which is going to show the problem. Yes, government should have a policy perspective, a long run policy perspective, uh, and basically let private sector solve the problem. I'm coming to India and the uh, you know, stress on public and private in a minute. Let me just finish the global scenario. The US at the moment, uh, uh, you know, probably the European economy has less of an impact on the world compared to the United States. Yeah. There, the labor market is very strong. So you think even over there, uh, the government and the Fed will have to slow down the economy so much that... Uh, well, you see, what's happening to the labor market because of the pandemic is a very interesting long-run adjustment because quite a lot of people are taking early retirement. Yes. You know, both, both in America and in Europe. What happens to a lot of people, especially uh, over there, if you have a pension, pension level job, and if you own your place of residence, the profit you will make from the selling that and, mm. you know. Investing it. Sort of going down a bit. Uh, economizing, we'll say you don't have to work. Okay. And a lot of people, we, we have, so out. the labor supply is behaving very differently from it used to. So a tight labor market is because people are not coming into the labor market. So unemployment is low because the younger people are working. 
No, this has been discussed quite a bit. Uh, a friend of mine, my, my colleague, Charles Goodhart, he has a co-author whose name I forget. Yes, and he's they speaking have, about inflation yeah, they have, in they the They have written a book about how labor force is going to Manoj change. Manoj Pradhan and... Yeah. And so, uh, this, this, he, they wrote this about four years ago. And so they could see it. And I think, so we have to tr uh, treat the unemployment numbers, labor tightness numbers, with a bit of care. Because, yes, American markets look, look very tight right now compared to, say, European markets. Europe is in more financial trouble than, than America is. But you know, America ultimately can print any amount of money and the world will absorb it. The global demand for dollars is fantastic. And everybody else doesn't have that luxury. That, that's exactly why I'm asking whether, you know, the Fed can manage a soft landing or will it have to go, you know, no, nearly no. as much as Walker? As it's difficult to say, you know, it depends upon the course of the war, but uh, it won't be easy. It won't be easy. So I, I think, I think a right high now, fa Fed funds rate for a longish bit is a likelihood. You know, in a sense, ultimately, I don't quite believe the real rate can be calculated very easily, but we've had a negative or zero real rate for a very long time. We've got to get out of the delusion. And I think Powell is still under the influence that he can, he can manage, but he can't. If the war goes on as I think it will go on, whether China does Taiwan or not, there's another story. I think the energy crisis is a very serious crisis. <clears throat> Even without the war, it was going to come because we had been neglecting climate change and all that. And <clears throat> Europe is really caught in energy crisis because they they sold their soul to Russia, whatever it is. And in Germany, was being very very creative. They wanted to compensate for all the damage they had done to Russia in the past yes. and all that sort of stuff. And so they shut down the nuclear plants and you know did this gas thing. Uh, I mean, in, from point of climate change, it was a disastrous thing going. Anyway, now we are caught. Caught. UK isn't that dependent, but uh, you know, uh, there's also 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 you see because of the Chinese used to do a lot of UK uh, in nuclear energy. Now there's a problem: can we continue with the Chinese or not? Okay. That that's an unknown. So I think this crisis is not going away. America may look very powerful and all that, but. A breakup in the majority community, which has never happened so far, on serious political problems. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of right now studying India and America as two countries which have a majoritarian program. I think Americans are going to have more difficulty than they think they are going to have. But let me stop you there because I have to take a commercial break. Sure. But thereafter, questions on India. How does the India growth story look? Do we take advantage because of this China plus one or diversification China? All those questions to Lord Desai in a minute after the break.